Donald right. John, um, first thing to say is that you've recently become a trustee of Westminster. Mm. We're delighted. And we know that we're going to learn a lot from you. And it's a happy timing, I suppose, because you've just published your book. Is this your first book? Um, it's was the, the, se the second or third, depending on, on how you count things. But yes, one, one other book on the on same topic as, as this and, and another book on one of the early Puritans, William Perkins. So, um, yes. Yes. And um, we're going to explore what you've written um, in All Things Are Ready. Tell us about the title, first of all. Where did that come from? It's obviously a, a quote from the parable. Yes, so it come, comes from the, the parable of, uh, of the wedding feast or the wedding banquet. And, you know, and, and it's really the message uh, from, from the host of the banquet, you know, who is, who is God the Father, you know, saying to everyone, um, the feast is there, you know, come, come to the wedding and, and enjoy the feast. So uh, a beautiful scriptural gospel invitation. And in writing this book, you obviously are of a mind that this is what the church needs to hear um, here and now. I suppose many of us will be aware that um, Arminianism is a danger to the church. In other words, um, human-centered evangelistic methods mm. of the back of a sense that it's all up to us. Um, in writing this book, you're signaling that there's a danger in the opposite direction. And I wonder if you could tell us um, how real you think that danger is and, and what it was that prompted you to put this uh, book out there? Yeah, I mean, th there were a couple of things that, that prompted the book. One, one was just reflections on, on the cultural time that we are in because you know, the, the West is increasingly hostile to, to the gospel. And, and there's therefore a danger that in settings like ours where you know, theology is really valued and where there's, there's such an abundance of, of good theological debates we can have, that we become inward looking in, in a moment where, you know, what our society needs is for churches with robust theology to be outward looking and carrying out the message of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ into a world that needs it more than ever, is more confused than ever, and, and needs to hear about the salvation that there is in Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to be very clear that actually, you know, the, the glory of the gospel you know, it isn't, isn't narrow. So the, the churches that, that should be most concerned about reaching out to, to the world are, are churches that both hold the sovereignty of God and all that that means, and also mm -hmm. hold that the gospel invitation is, is for all because, you know, we can um, take that message out in the confidence that, you know, the Lord of the harvest will ensure that there is a harvest to be reaped from going out even in hard times with the gospel. So that, that burden to encourage ministries to be um, proclaiming the gospel week by week that burden to encourage christians to be sharing the gospel week by week was really what what drove the the writing of the book mm. donald john um what i applaud about what you're doing there is that it's so easy to see the flaws in our opponent's point of view it's so difficult to see mm. where um, the flaws in our own tradition may take us if we're not careful and we're not guarded. Um, and it seems to me that you're saying you have come across in your personal experience sections of the Reformed Church that are inward looking mm. and um, out of a perhaps a reactionary approach to the, the um, revivalism of mm. recent centuries. Mm. Yes, so one of the tricks of the or tricks, one of the, the great challenges of the Christian life is is to maintain balance. And and so often when we see a a false view in one way, we can we can go in reaction to that too far the other way. And and I think in terms of um, the danger of becoming insular, um, forgetting the command to go into all the world and make disciples is 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 a challenge for us. And I think also on a practical level so when when people in churches sort of understand the doctrines of election understand the doctrines of predestination embrace god's sovereignty it can almost lead to pastoral problems and pastoral challenges so it's it's also we will all have come across people tied in knots over um you know if god chooses 
who is saved, how, how can I know that, that I am saved? And so it also speaks in that way to everyone in, in Reformed churches that you are invited to, to the gospel feast and, and it deals with these kind of challenges as well. And I know that you have a, a great concern, Donald John, for the character of God, that it's possible, isn't it, for us to misrepresent Mm. of and the grace and the warm-heartedness mm. of our God and the genuineness of the gospel offer. Mm. Ab ab absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's vital to hold everything that we know about God, his, his absolute holiness, his, yes. his justice, his sovereignty, but it's holding everything in scriptural balance so, so that, you know, people understand that you know, as, as Lamentation says, you know, God does not afflict the children of men willingly nor, nor grieve them from his heart. And, and, you know, and it's important to, you know, to understand these verses in the way that, you know, the Puritans and, and the reformers did. You know, it, it's an image that I always go back to is, you know, Thomas Manton, the great Puritan, commenting on that verse, um, you know, says, relatively speaking, you know, judgment is forced from God. You know, God's mm -hmm. mercy is, is like honey, you know, just dropping from the spoon and and and, and that's that, that's what flows freely from god and that, that i think is is a wonderful balance to to hold that yes yes god is just absolutely holy punishes sin angry with the wicked every day but actually you know he doesn't afflict willingly his, his mercy runs from him freely and that's so important that when people see our lives understand how we speak about god that that's the scriptural balance they take away well, John, that's very, um, yeah, there's a, there's a refreshing element to what you're saying. I wonder, shall we start with something very, very simple? What is the gospel? Mm. Your, 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 your book is subtitled Understanding the Gospel in its fullness and in its freeness. What is, what is the gospel? Mm. Thanks, John. Yeah, so I, I started the book with a chapter on, on what is the gospel, um, largely because you know, even in the evangelical church, there's there's so many concerns, questions, confusion over you know what what the gospel is. Um, is it about you know doing good things? Is it about you know other? And and the answer is these are in themselves helpful things, but the gospel is fundamentally the Lord Jesus Christ his mission to come into the world to seek and to save those who were lost him coming to give his life a ransom for the many his life his death his resurrection that it that is the gospel the gospel is jesus christ and the salvation that that he brings and because it is the gospel of the lord jesus christ it, it is so full you know he is the god man everything he does is full his salvation is complete. Nothing needs to be added to it. His salvation is the only remedy against sin. And, and the glory of the gospel is that good news, that that greatest of all news is, is freely offered to, to everyone. You know, we don't have to earn a right to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be a certain kind of person to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and the burden of the book was, was just to exalt Jesus Christ in that way and to show that all are freely called to come to him. And um, I'd, I'd like us to, to um, just hear a little bit more from you on the, on the fullness of the gospel. I think by that term, Don John, you're implying that the needs that we have in our human condition mm are fully met in Jesus Christ? And are you also implying that, um, that there is a fullness in Jesus Christ for the whole world? Um, um, and of course, therein lies the debate. Uh, perhaps you could um, tease out that, that word fullness for us. So, so yes, so that, that, that fullness effectively says that Jesus Christ is a fitting saviour for everyone. Mm. That what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, because 
he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is that promise that whoever comes to him, he will in no wise or he will never, never cast out. And that's that's the fullness of Jesus Christ. There is full, free, complete salvation in him. Now, if, if we parse that out a bit more theologically, then clearly what we are not denying there is, is particular redemption or a view that we hold very strongly and very preciously that Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So there are mysteries, there are difficulties and all of these things. We need to be careful how we express mm -hmm. things. But what particular redemption, definite atonement, Christ's love and death for his people, what that doesn't mean is that the fullness of what our Lord has done in the gospel isn't offered to everyone and everyone isn't called to that salvation that there is in Jesus Christ. Yes. yes. And um, you have written within, within your book on, on that note, John, John, it is because Jesus' death is of infinite merit that he can promise never to cast out any who mm -hmm. come to him. And I think what I'm hearing from you is that we lose that sense at our peril because it contains great pastoral benefit, great encouragement. Where, where if, if we focus too much on limited atonement in a pastoral or in an evangelistic context, mm -hmm. um, we can end up supplying people with an excuse not to come to Christ. Is, is, is that um, essentially part of your emphasis here? Yes, I think any any scriptural truth can be pastorally misapplied or or proclaimed out of balance. So it's a wonderful, beautiful, encouraging truth that Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, has a special love for his people and, and died for them. But that can never be preached in such a way as it shuts out people or, or creates a barrier for people to believe. Um, you know, because, you know, again, to, to come back to the wedding feast and, and the title of the book all things are ready and and that that call goes out to many who reject the wedding feast um, mm. but yet the message is there is no barrier there is no insufficiency in the feast that i have set before you um, it is not because there isn't enough food that you aren't coming to the wedding feast it's because you reject it and and that's you know the message that everyone needs to understand is that the barrier is not in the worth and the merit of what the Lord Jesus has done. Yeah. So Don John, if we, if we, we've spoken about the gospel and its fullness and its freeness, um, what I'd like us to do is to try and understand where your opponents are coming from, how they express themselves and being as fair as possible to them, mm. how they reap that position, why, why they have come to the view that they have. So I wonder if you could, I mean, essentially we're talking about something which, which often goes by the name of hyper Calvinism. Mm. Um, the clue is in the name. It's taking mm. us to extremes. Mm. What is it that our, our brothers and sisters who are hyper Calvinists are saying um, without erecting a straw man here? Mm. Uh, and how have they come to that view? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are different, flavors, different, different varieties of hyper-Calvinism, as, as it were, it, it, it will go from the most extreme version, which is, you know, the only gospel that there is, is for, you know, thirsty sinners, convicted sinners, sinners who are qualified to receive the gospel, you know, so the gospel is only for a very small number, um, through to um, varieties that would be much closer to ourselves, who, who would say that um, you know, the gospel tells everyone certain facts sort of you know the gospel is if you believe you will be saved if you don't believe you you will be condemned um, and where, where all of these things come from along that spectrum is in essence taking precious doctrines like election like like the sovereignty of god and and then drawing unwarranted conclusions from them so if god has decided to show saving grace only to his people if he shows saving love only to his people then there can be no other love or concern or, or grace in God to, to anyone else. And, you know, if God in his secret will has, has chosen to save a certain people, you know, he can't show goodwill, as it were, to, to anyone else. And um, where, where we say is, 
scripture doesn't draw logical conclusions like that. Scripture paints a very different picture. And so that tells us immediately that our logical conclusions are unwarranted and, and wrong. And what, what is at stake here really is, in a sense, the, the, nature, the nature of God himself and, and the trustworthiness of his revelation in, in scripture so that we, you know, we, we don't have to treat scripture in a high-handed way when, when God himself says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their ways and live in, in Ezekiel 18. We have to take that at, at face value, embrace it, and, and preach it. So, Don John, you're affirming the premise of the position, which is that mm. um, atonement is limited mm -hmm. to the elect, but you're denying what appears to the Hyper Calvinist to be a logical inference of that. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose you might be saying uh, there's a mystery here. Mm -hmm. Sure does sound as though um, we have no right to be preaching the gospel to all if, if atonement is limited. Uh, but in some way that I don't understand, that logic doesn't hold good. Or are you able to help us see where the logic found us? Yeah, um, so there's, there's, there's quite a section in, in the book on, on sort of objections to the gospel offer, and, and that, that touches on, on a number of these things. So mm -hmm. in terms of you know, Christ dying for his people only, then it, it does fall back on some of the points about the sufficiency of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is able to save all who come to God through him. And he himself has told us that. So there is no barrier in, in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then on, on, on other matters, again, it's, it's a case of, you know, taking, taking scripture in, in, in its balance. And, you know, if, if we say that, you know, God has only shown saving good to his people, um, we also show that scripture shows that God is good to all. Um, you know, we, we turn to the Psalms when it says that God's mercies are over all his works. We turn to our Savior's teaching when he says, you know, we, we are to love those who hate us and, and to love our enemies, you know, because... God does, and and we round out you know the, the whole teaching of these scriptures, and we we can make you know distinctions. So you know we don't say that God loves everyone in the same way. We make a distinction between saving grace and common grace, electing love and and general love. So we can show how these things are not inconsistent, but there is always that difficulty as finite creatures in in harmonizing everything that there is in God. And what we never want to do is remake God in our image by, you know, only, you know, carrying a cardboard cutout God that we can fit in our back pockets because God is greater than we can, than we can imagine. Um, yeah. Um, you once said to me, you once said to me, Donald John, that at the time of the enlightenment, reason was elevated above mm. revelation as mm. the ultimate source of truth. Mm. I think this may have a bearing on this. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to develop that theme? Yeah, I think I think that is that is huge in terms of you know uh, how we embrace scientific logic as as the ultimate source of truth and and how that impacts the way we think about about theology. You know, when when you go back to someone like a Calvin, um, you know, he he will be full of images around you know such as the brightness of the light that emanates from the glory of God. Is it any surprise that we are blinded when we behold His Majesty and can you know understand and, and see the fullness of what's going on? And you know, any any theology that that doesn't you know leave us at the end of Romans eleven, you know, how unsearchable are His ways and His judgments past finding out is, you know, is is not you know scriptural theology, you know. If, if we think we know everything as we should do, then we don't really know anything. And that's a lesson that, you know, we, we need to keep at the front of our minds. Yeah. Ultimately, that's an expression of the inscrutable nature of God. Mm -hmm. Our finite minds are not going to be able to comprehend the infinite. Absolutely. And, um, he is holy. He is other than us. Absolutely. Um, you've spoken about your concern in writing the book that we don't become narrow, insular, and um, begrudging in our evangelism. Mm. But I think you are also at pains to safeguard the sufficiency 
of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, and that's another element to this whole debate, isn't it, Don John? Um, you quote approvingly James Durham, um, and I'll just read this from, from, mm. from your book. So James Durham um, was responding, responding to those people who regarded deep conviction of sin to be a qualification on the part of those who are accepting the gospel invitation. And, and, and he says, nay, in some way, it excludes these as offering to bring money and some price, which would quite spoil the market of free grace. Nay, yet I say further, if it were possible that a soul could come without a sense of sin, grace would embrace it. Oh. Um, develop that for us, Dolce. We're not used to hearing um, anybody say, don't bring with you a sorrow for sin. So that's a curious thing for us to read. I suppose, what, what does James Durham mean and why are you quoting it with approval? Mm. Yes. So, so maybe I'll start with what James Durham isn't saying and then, and then get to what he, what he is saying. So he isn't saying that you know, a sense of sin is unimportant. He isn't saying that conviction of sin doesn't matter. He, you know, he fully realizes that, that the teaching of scripture that you know, it's those who are sick who need a physician. So in, in order to value a physician, there needs to be that sense of sickness and, and awareness of sin. But what he is absolutely saying is that our sense of sin is not our right to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we don't come to him parading a sense of sinfulness or you know, I, I've become aware enough of my sin that I can, that I can now go to you as my savior and what he's saying is if, if that's our thought process actually we're turning our sin and our sense of sin into a good work that we bring to the lord jesus christ and he is saying that we are told you know come without money and without price so come to the lord jesus christ rather than looking into yourself to have i become aware enough of my sin that i can present it as a merit to the lord jesus and you know that that is so important in terms of grasping the freeness of the gospel as, as this is a john a john murray line you know faith is essentially extrospective so faith in its essence doesn't look inwards to how much sin i have faith looks outward to how great the lord jesus christ is and and pastorally that's that's so important and durham is saying you know, don't get tied up looking internally to weigh how sinful you feel you are just come to the Lord Jesus Christ and actually in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ it's only then you begin to begin to understand how sinful you are um, because it's, it's in embracing his love and his salvation that you know the weight and extent of our sins really come home to us. So you're saying uh, in effect that um, there are really two dangers that we're guarding against the first is that for those of us who know ourselves to be Christians mm. evangelism would be hampered by an over preoccupation on whether the person we're speaking to is elect or not. Uh -huh. But you're also saying that for those of us who are struggling with the question of um, um, whether we have the right to come to Christ in the first place, our, our accepting the gospel will uh -huh. be hampered by a, a, an over scrutiny of our own motives and, uh -huh. and a tendency to ask the question, am I elect? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, I suppose that I see more of the first than of the second. Mm -hmm. Have you seen from a pastoral point of view that there are people who struggle to come to Christ because they actually are unsure whether they're elect or not? Yes, yes. And I, I think this would be more, more common in... Um, in certain pockets so i think um there are elements of the dutch reform tradition where that would be a challenge there are elements of my own tradition in the highlands of scotland where, where that would be where that would be a challenge and i think it's a danger almost anywhere the sovereignty of god is is exalted and, and and proclaimed that people draw the wrong implications from it rather than the sovereignty of god being a beautiful encouragement for us um, and a beautiful motive to actually you know, trust in the in, in the all-powerful god um it, it can become if our minds look too much to ourselves that that danger and so yeah you know pastorally it, it can be a big problem 
yes. And um, I love what you've just said there, Donald John. I think it's massive. Um, essentially, what you're saying is that um, in our fallen human nature, we take what ought to be a mm. great encouragement to us mm. and to Christ mm. and turn it into an obstacle. Yes. And that, that encouragement is precisely that because God is sovereign in salvation, mm. we actually are not bringing anything with us. He's done it all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from a pastoral point of view, then, you're saying that there's great sweetness to be found in the doctrine of the sovereign election of God. Draw that out for us, um, mm. perhaps in its twofold aspect. Um, how does that help us in our evangelism, knowing that God is sovereign in mm. salvation? And how does it help us if we are struggling with assurance and with, with our right to come to Christ in the first place? Mm. So, I mean, in terms of the, the activity of evangelism, then, you know, it, it's a great encouragement that the results don't depend on us. Um, you know, the yeah. results don't depend on how, how well we present the gospel, that however weakly, however feebly we explain things, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Um, and that he, you know, will bless and will gather his people through whatever feeble efforts are used. So it's a great empowering tool. Um, it doesn't take the weight off us in terms of we have to do our duty because God uses means, but it does take the weight off us in terms of results because results are in, are in God's hands. And that's a great, a great encouragement. Uh, and, and in terms of, you know, individuals you know, struggling with assurance, struggling with these things, then the great encouragement of, of the sovereignty of God is, you know, our, our struggles, our, our doubts, our, our weaknesses, um, you know, we, we cast them all before the sovereign God who, who in all of his power and grace and mercy um, will forgive all our doubts and deal with all our uncertainties and will carry his people home at last to heaven. So it, it's a great sweet thing both for our evangelistic efforts and, and for God's people who are struggling. Thank you. Donald John um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the one, I think, who coined the phrase cheap grace. Mm. Um, and he was undoubtedly combating a real enemy, people who essentially had been told, come to Jesus, uh, believe on him, and you've got your ticket to heaven, and then carry on as you were. Um, and I suppose what we're seeking to do at the, uh, um, is constantly to avoid deviating from the narrow path, either on the right-hand side, um, by making a strong sense of the conviction of sin uh, mm. prerequisite to being a Christian, or indeed on the left-hand side, where it seems as though um, people don't have any awareness of their sin at all. How do we, how do we um, combat easy believism, cheap grace? Mm. So I think it's, you know, if, if we come back to, you know, that the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ and in all the fullness of he is, then I think it's avoiding that sort of narrow view of gospel preaching, you know, which is you know, a gospel sermon is John 3.16. And, and that's, you know, that, that's what we mean. Actually, the gospel is, 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 is preaching the Lord Jesus Christ in his fullness. So it, it will, over the course of faithful gospel preaching, the Lord Jesus as our prophet, our priest, and our king. And that's who is offered to us in the gospel. So he is, he is our priest who laid down his life for our sins. He is, he is our prophet who, who teaches us how to live and lays obligations on us. And he is our king who rules over us, protects us, and, and gives us laws to live by. So it's the gospel in all its fullness of who the Lord Jesus is, is ultimately what guards against easy yeah. believism on the one hand or um int introspection on on the other um yes. and that's yes um in some ways um the question that i'm formulating has been answered but i think it would be helpful nevertheless for you to draw some threads together for us mm. um why does the church need to hear this in our day and age and what is the church to do with this doctrine of, mm. of the gospel 
I mean, I think that the church needs to hear and, and be reminded, and I know in my own heart, I need to hear and be reminded of, of the glories of the salvation that, that God has uh, so freely wrought for us in, in Jesus Christ. It just it does my soul good to hear of God's mercy and his love and his grace and the forgiveness of sins that there are in Jesus Christ. So the, the church needs this message to do us good, to lift up our eyes, to behold the grace of our God and who he is. And, and that encourages us to take that out in, into a lost world that, that really needs it. And, and I think it's, it's important that it's, it's modeled almost from the front in terms of the preaching, the, the eldership, because if, if the grace of God and the gospel is, is preached week by week faithfully, it encourages the sharing of that gospel kind of infectiously by those who are in the church. And, and that is, you know, that's the, the need of the hour in terms of, you know, the world hearing the good news against the, the darkness, the, the sinfulness, the brokenness of our age. Well, Father John, that's a wonderful note on which to end. Mm. Um, I'm delighted you've published this book and uh, I can personally recommend it very warmly indeed. Mm. And um, I look forward very much to working with you as my trustee. Thank you, John. Thank you. The very best. Bye-bye now. Goodbye.